Call tonight. So it's a planning board meeting to order. Anna, please call the roll. Paul Rabitis. Here. Jason Berry. Here. Jeremy Rhodes. Here. Chris Horton. Here. David Witham. Here. Robert Belmore. Here. Mark Richardson. Here. Doug Haberman. Here. Ron LaHoulier. Here. This time I'd like to appoint Mr. Haberman as full voting member for the evening. First item is approval of minutes of January 17, 2024. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Berry. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Abstain. Please. Abstention. Committee reports. Any comments on the summary of the land use board report? City Council report. Mr. Witham. Yeah, nothing too substantial, just uh, from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, Council is moving forward with its road resurfacing project for 2024, awarding that bid to GMI Asphalt out of uh, the Lakes Region, Belmont, New Hampshire. Thank you. Um, we used them last year. We were very pleased with the quality of their work and the timeliness of their work. Uh, so we're going back with them this year. Uh, biggest street on the list is West High Street from Cemetery Road to High Street, that section that delaminates frequently. Uh, a number of side streets off of uh, High Street, Pleasant, Silver, that area of the city. Uh, we are finalizing uh, engineering documents to go out to bid to uh, reconstruct the sidewalk on the westerly side of High Street between West High and Memorial Drive, basically the mirror image of the side we did last year. And that will also include uh, resurfacing of that section of High Street as well. So that gateway, if you will, will be uh, brought to a conclusion provided uh, bids come in uh, where we uh, can see them. Also, continue to move the ball forward with a complete streets project on Constitutional Way. Uh, Public Works and the Environment Committee had a first look at that today, teeing up some legislation to proceed with that work. Uh, that will likely be one plus construction seasons, uh, most of the work done in one construction season uh, with a finished coat and clean up in the following construction season, similar to what we did with Cemetery Road a couple of years ago. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witham. Stratford Regional Planning Commission update, Mr. Richardson. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we got a couple of things coming up. Um, tomorrow we'll be meeting at um, <coughs> Flight Coffee in Dover as part of the economic development tours that we're doing and seeing what bit local businesses are doing in their, in their communities. Um, we've done um, two regional impact meetings are on two issues one meeting on two issues, housing, were both of them. Uh, one, one was uh, 148 duplexes or 296 units. Uh, certainly there was in traffic impact issues there, um, water issues. Um, the other one was a 17 unit. It, these were not in, obviously not in Summersworth, but another one was a 17 unit. Uh, housing development, again, the same thing with water issues. And so, you know, our recommendations is that DES look into those things and that they get a water engineer to look at those issues. And so, um, the, the, oddly enough, the 296 housing units, not a, three streets, not a single sidewalk, and also a, um, um, a uh, like a community center for the neighborhood being built, not a single sidewalk in 296 units, one and two bedrooms. So that's up to the local planning board to deal with that issue, but it was a recommendation that we made so <laughs> that they deal with that. Um, those are getting interesting for all kinds of reasons. Um, let's see, what else did I write down here? Oh, we have couple of meetings coming up too uh, that are being planned to deal with the issue of solid waste. So those will be interesting, I think. All set? Yes. Thank you. Eyes on 30 to 2030, Commander, Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we met yesterday, uh, had a nice meeting. Uh, we spent a little bit of time getting to know the new members. We have a new chair and a new seat. So we spent a little time getting to know one another. Um, we did spend some time going over the current 
uh, all, all the current categories and some of the ideas that were brought forward. So we do have intentions of going back through and having a few hard sessions where we really go and um, work the ideas that are going into those new categories. Um, we also discussed our strategy and how we want to move forward in 2024. So I think there's a lot of really exciting things to come. Uh, nothing really new to report yet, but when we have something, I'll bring it forward. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Community Power Coalition, Mr. Horton. Yeah, no meeting uh, since our last. Uh, I think we are in a holding pattern until we hear back from New Hampshire Power Coalition. So, but no report. I would jump in and just say that City Council is dealing with a few agreements that the council has to sign. We reviewed a couple of those uh, with Henry Herndon from the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire uh, this afternoon, uh, teeing up uh, some additional agreements beyond the aggregation agreement that the committee took up. So. The ball continues to move there um, unimpeded, so it's on track. Thank you. Oh, uh, housing Committee, Mr. Horton. Housing Committee uh, has our first, first meeting tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Thank you very much. Next item is old business. Is there any old business that may come before the board? Director Mears. None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Next, we'll get into new business. I'd like to ask everybody to please turn off or uh, mute your cell phones and other electronic devices. Also, if you care to speak this evening, come up to the podium, state your name and address or your affiliation, and speak into the microphone. If you have to stray from the podium, we do have a portable mic you can use. On the new business, item 4A, Housing Chapter Presentation by Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Director Mears. Yes, so you should have all received my, uh, an email from Anna regarding a memo regarding the master plan update that was requested at the last meeting. Uh, I outlined where we are in the process for the housing chapter. Uh, we do have a draft uh, chapter that was also emailed uh, that will be presented tonight. Um, and Angie Cleveland from Stra Stratford Regional Planning Commission is uh, here to present that. Uh, we are also hoping to have an update uh, planning board workshop for the next meeting, March 20th at 5.30. Uh, this would be uh, to go over the natural resources and land use chapter. This is the section of the master plan chapter that is required. So if members are okay with that, I'm hoping that that could be scheduled for 5.30. Uh, the vision uh, and the land use chapter are the required chapters of this. So we are kicking that off. Also, uh, regional planning will be here for the housing chapter as well. So without, uh, Angie, you, you do have a presentation, sorry. She has a PowerPoint presentation. All right, hello, good to see you all again. I'm gonna put this up here because I have a couple of notes in the presentation. Oh, good. And do you all have screens at your, or are you looking up there? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> You'd think I would remember that, I was here. All right, so for the record again, Angela Cleveland with the Stratford Regional Planning Commission. I am your project manager for the Living in Summersworth, a housing plan for the city. So we're excited to present the draft, which you have in your packets. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Probably would be helpful, right? So you can see what I'm seeing. There you go. Uh, so after, I guess it's been about yeah, seven or eight months now that we've been working on this chapter. And as you know, we came to you in October with uh, some discussion and where we were at with some highlights from both the survey as well as the community workshop that we held last September. Um, so based on that, as well as some feedback from others, we did create this draft. Um, so I'll go over a little bit of what that is, including some of the themes that we presented in there, which is how we're trying to embrace our chapters these days. Uh, a lot of chapters tend to be, you know, novels uh, <laughs> that people are not reading. So we're taking a new approach to our master plans, of course, based on the community being okay with that. Uh, and in this case, it was. So we proceeded. Um, but there'll be a lot of data and appendices that are that follow with this and as part of the, the final deliverable. We probably have 50 different data points that we could um, pass along to you folks, especially uh, Chris for the, the housing committee, which I met with the mayor about today. So uh, that'll be a great resource for you all. So then we'll look at uh, just how 
some guidance basically and tips on how to review the chapter. We're hoping that uh, over the next month you can do that and we'll come back in March, uh, again, as Michelle mentioned, uh, on the 20th for hopefully for adoption, but for a vote at least, uh, and we'll move on. So as I mentioned, we're really trying to take a pro an approach that this should be a living document. This should be a short document, but not so short that it's not meaningful, um, but that, that it should be chock full of information that are going to help you with decision making regarding housing in this instance. So we have uh, a variety of data points that we've used, some of our American Community Survey data, some of it's raw data that we actually analyzed, and some of it is mapping. Um, so there's a good mix of everything in there that we think tells the story for Summersworth and related to housing. We came up with seven themes that we batted around quite a bit with the, the planning team to make sure that they really are capturing where Summersworth needs to go in the future to address housing and especially around housing needs, which I'll, I'll go into, with six goals and 29 actions, very achievable. Um, again, oftentimes we see master plans that have 50 to 100 actions and then you get planning fatigue or you have paralysis and then nothing happens but it sits on a shelf. So we're hoping that this will set the housing committee and the city in general up for success in achieving that. So we, the themes were developed using a variety of, of resources. We really wanted to make sure we were listening to the community. So the survey with over 300 responses really gave us a good baseline. And from that and the results, we developed a community workshop where we dove even deeper. Um, and so, and thank you, I see a lot of familiar faces, obviously, including our commissioners, um, for attending that because we wanted to hear from you and we felt that that feedback was really key for us to develop, again, reasonable and achievable themes as well as goals and actions. Uh, we had that planning board workshop with you all back in, in October, and then we did a lot of data analysis. So after all of that, we kind of we really just had to kind of do some number crunching and information crunching. Um, it does rep represent some important points for you to organize your efforts, and not just for the housing committee, but we feel that the planning board and other committees um, should also feel ownership over, over housing, whether that's ZBA, whether that's even the Conservation Commission to a certain degree, uh, but we do feel like this will be a great baseline and a blueprint for you all. And it does address supply, affordability, things that we're all talking about lately around housing, workforce, your demographics, the local needs, your housing stock is really key, and then availabilities of land to actually make sure that you're, uh, that you're set up to be able to develop the, the units that are needed. So we'll start with the population changing. And again, I'm not gonna go through all of the seven themes tonight, but I wanna go through a couple that we felt were stark enough to make a, a case. Uh, the first one is around population and that it is changing, and this is common in every community. So here you see basically a 10-year span from 2011 to 2021 where you're seeing a larger, which is most communities, a larger influx of baby boomers. And, and then in this case, you're actually seeing a smaller number of Generation X folks. Um, so no, sh limited number of, of kids <laughs> coming into schools um, and uh, an aging population, which if you saw, um, I think it was the Hampton News uh, or the Seacoast News this, the, t about a week and a half ago, is that this is really putting a strain on our emergency services, especially more so than we thought. Um, and, you know, and, and kind of going and shifting a little bit differently than we thought with ho new housing actually being more associated with kids in the schools, it's actually uh, going the other way. So it'll be interesting to see how our communities address that um, and especially as we develop new units to meet their needs. Um, the median age, if you look at this, you're not going to see that necessarily, but if you do quick math, it's about 39.7, which is actually still lower than the median age of 43. So still a younger city in a lot of ways. Um, and this is important, as I mentioned, it, it really does help us help inform how and what type of develop, uh, housing developments and just housing in general that we can create. So with those the aging population and the, defi the declining birth rates, um, we have an average population, uh, average household size also going down. Again, setting another record, not just for the county, and, but also for the state, in uh, average household size being lower than, uh, than the full county in, the, in New Hampshire, um, with 2.33 people per household. And you're seeing a decline in, in uh, community, excuse me, in households with children as well, from 35,000 down, excuse me, 35 percent down to 30 percent, which is still in the higher uh, uh, than than the rest of our re, our communities. Uh, we have some communities that are as low as 12, 13 percent of the households with children. So it's still kind of in the in the middle, if you will. 
but declines in those other places. So you see, you know, one family, one household, excuse me, one person households being 31%, so a third of your population living alone. And they tend to want the apartments or the smaller homes, maybe with an extra bedroom for whether it's a kid or, you know, a friend or, um, or someone they're dating. Um, so it really does, it, it, this is really something that we need to pay attention to as far as preferences and who we're developing housing for. So the next one we'll go to is that there, the current housing stock doesn't meet all local needs. And there are a variety of things that we made this point for. The big one here are, are the, your occupations and who the average, what the average occupation is in Summersworth. So you have retail, um, really high on the health care and practitioners, um, education, food service and prep. This isn't all the occupations, but we wanted to do the big, the big ticket ones. And unfortunately, right now, the only occupation, and this is for an experienced person that can meet the average median uh, household, or excuse me, house, housing price of 365 is the experienced healthcare practitioners. So the others are what we, considered, or we consider housing burdened. About 35% of the population in Summersworth is paying more than 30% for their housing and related expenses. So that we call that housing burdened. Um, and this does obviously t take a lot into, our cons into consideration for how people spend and what they can do on their off hours and you know, how their kids can be able to participate in the community as well. So it's something, again, that we need to continue to address. And then lastly, we'll switch over to the, so uh, about a year, it's been a year that we've released the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, where the entire state uh, worked with New Hampshire Housing Finance and the state and others to identify what per community and per the region, how many new housing units we will need both by 2030 and by 2040. So we just went out to 2040 for this, but we did look at 2030 as well for Summersworth. And this is how it's broken down. And we wanted to do this by renter and uh, by owner occupied because we felt that that would help a little bit to see what that mix should be and to be able to work successfully with developers so that they can see what the need is as well. And in Summersworth, oddly, it's actually the owner occupied that you need more of than renter. You have a really good mix of renter versus owner occupied anyways. Um, but when you d dig a little deeper, it's important to see that it really is the below 100% area median income that we need to build those units. With a, with a, a little bit above as well, but that's that missing middle folks. So those are the folks between the 80% and 100% and below, but really that 80 to 100% where they do not qualify for, for um, income eligible housing or affordable housing, but they can't really afford you know, your average, you know, your, your larger, uh, bigger house, market rate house, or, or in this case, sometimes um, um, apartments. So looking at that is really good, is really important so that we can see what that, again, what that mix should be. Um, so you're looking at probably about a third versus two thirds of, of owner versus renter occupied. And again, these are just estimates. Um, we, this is based on need and based on population growth and other factors that this, the, help, the state helped us put together. Um, but ultimately we think this plan will set you up for b building those. Um, this does not take into consideration some of the things that have been approved lately. I do wanna make sure I, I add that note. <laughs> this uh, analysis was done last year before some of the most recent developments that you approved. And then we looked at developable land, and this is in the, your, your, um, your chapter as well, so you'll see this map. So we looked at how, uh, if you physically constrain uh, certain areas of town, whether it's through um, the current, you know, obviously current, whatever's currently developed, conservation land, wetlands, water, steep slopes, this is what the developable land that's remaining in Summersworth, and this is all developable land. But what happens when you only put the uh, overlay, the infrastructure where water and sewer are available, then you can see where the other developable land is available. So it's it's pretty stark difference. You know, you basically see your northeast or yeah, north. I guess that's northeast, almost directly north area, not developable if you don't consider that it's on inf uh, public infrastructure. So we did, uh, and this analysis is in your in the chapter, and we break this down by parcel too. And we'll start to dig a little bit into that with the audit as well to look at non-conforming lots and look at what this could look like, you know, for build out basically and what where you should be focusing some of your efforts. And then also goes into our audit based on, you know, what we think the ordinance could or should um, change to be able to allow for different densities, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a tweak on your ADUs, et cetera. But that's in March, so I'm not going to give that away. <laughs> 
So I want to give a couple of tips on what we're hoping to uh, have you review the draft, or on how we are hoping to have you review the draft uh, chapter. So we, we're hoping that the themes resonate, but please let us know if, if something's not clear, um, if something, you know, is it, is it just, it's just not sinking in somehow? We'd love to talk with you about that and make sure, again, that you feel ownership over these themes and they're correctly uh, capturing how you think we, you need to be address housing in the future. Uh, if there are any questions on the tables, charts, maps, there's quite a few of them in there, but we feel that they help tell the story again. And so if you think there's something missing or something that could be tweaked a little bit, well, we definitely would like to, to hear that. Uh, on the goals and actions, any clarifications, especially regarding the actions, are they clear enough? Are they straightforward enough? Are there additional actions that you think we should be considering as a city? And then anything major missing. <laughs> Hopefully we've talked enough over the past seven to eight months that there isn't anything missing, but we wanna make sure that that is the case. We will fix all formatting. I, I did go through this with a fine tooth comb several times over the last week. So for spelling and grammatical issues, but um, that will be, and then it'll be in a, in a more formatted version, but we wanted to have it be something that you could, we didn't wanna put too much time into the formatting until we heard from the planning board, let me put it that way. So we're hoping that uh, comments could be sent either to me or to Michelle or Anna, however you would like to do that. I don't mind them coming directly to me and then I'll make sure Michelle sees them. We'll compile all of those and update the draft and then uh, have that back out to you before the March 20th meeting in anticipation of a vote. So, any questions? I know you just got this this morning, so I don't expect any on the actual chapter, but... <laughs> Real quick, you talked about the infrastructure and you had the two maps that showed the difference. Um, you were looking, I'm guessing, at both water and sewer. If you look at water, we're pretty well covered citywide. Yeah, so it's uh, mostly sewer. So it's mostly sewer. Yeah. Right. Yep. I had a question on that. I don't understand why we're considering sewer as eliminating um, areas that can't have housing because a lot of, a lot of subdivisions, I have a set, private septic. That there are quite a few uh, subdivisions that are private sector. So some of that area that you're just counting could have private sector and probably has city water. Well, we're not necessarily discounting it. It's just if it's a, in some communities deciding factor on more density is really probably the bigger issue. It's not necessarily single family it'd be around duplexes and higher. We're much, really more multifamily and higher. Well, I think it needs more clarity because I don't. Okay. I would agree. Uh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. A great point. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes, Mr. Horton. Uh, one piece that I'd love to get some more information on as we get closer to a, a final component is a little bit of a broader view outside of Summers Roof directly, particularly where we're kind of sandwiched between two significantly larger areas in terms of footprint. With Rochester and Dover, we do a lot of initiatives as part of the Tri-City area. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see how housing could be addressed as a broader concern there as well. So it, do you want data that... Uh, preferably data-backed uh, information there, so around uh, housing demand projected for uh, the Tri-City area, uh, around how we could potentially work with Rochester, Dover, and the other smaller communities in our area to try to address some of that need as an area as opposed to just an insular look at our city itself. I definitely, th I like the idea that the data, that, that makes sense. I'm not sure we can say how we can work together right now. That would probably be a strategy that sure. you could include in it because I love that idea. I think that it makes sense to collaborate because we're yeah. all thinking it's just like, oh no, it's just me that has to do this, but everybody has their own <laughs> yeah, it's, need it's, for housing. It's a lot to try to predict what's going to happen in you know, 5, 10, 15 years, but if we can get some of the data that can help us drive a broader view, that would be extremely helpful. Sure. Great. Great point. Thank you. Mr. Horton. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. The, all the good information and presentation, Angie. A um, couple of uh, things that stand out for me is I like the data you provided on the inventory, how it, it kind of highlights the um, mix between owner-occupied owner and, and rental stock. Uh, additionally, just kind of skimming through uh, your handout, uh, you, you highlighted that from 2000 to 2009, the city saw 450 building permits, and then a drastic decline through the 2010, uh, 2010 through 2019 period. So can you kind of elaborate on that, if you had any findings or any reasoning behind the drastic decline in that period? 
Uh, we've seen this as a trend throughout this, not just the state, well, mostly New England. I, I'm not sure too much outside of New England, but I, my experience is with Massachusetts and, and New Hampshire, and it, that every map, every chart like that looks the same. Okay. I was just, thank you for that, though, Chris, by the way, because uh, that reminded me that we're still going to, we're still collaborating with the planning department to get uh, 2019 and 2023 so that we can make that full, that full gap. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and maybe Michelle has some other... Uh, she can shed some light on maybe a summer's worth specific case on why the sp steep decline, but we've seen that all over where, it, and they actually just talked about it on a webinar this morning where every community is seeing a decline in building permits after 2008, basically, and just never recovered. I think from 2010 to 2015, there was more commercial development happening uh, as opposed to residential development, and that had to do with the housing. Uh, what was it called the housing finance the finance yeah <laughs> so um that's i think that's why also something to point out as part of this plan it takes years to build out these housing developments we are uh, finally seeing some of these housing developments that were approved back in 2014 uh come in for street acceptance so we want to make sure that that's documented in the housing chapter and i've talked to regional planning about this uh to make sure all of the subdivisions and the multifamily uh, is documented that it takes a long time to build these out and they're usually phased projects. Mr. Wiggum and Mr. Richardson. Thank you. Your mind can go on forever and ever just, you know, how is this, how could this be, what can we do? So yeah, this is a great uh, leap pad really into this whole conversation. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think would be helpful is an example or two so for example you talk about owner occupied in that category for people that are living below the median income mm -hmm. what is an example there like a tiny home or what oh to, to meet their housing needs yes so I, I i understand that that's a demographic we want to try to uh, address what is it that addresses that? I so the front the front page has an example of different housing types that okay. is what we call, consider this new term. It's not really even new, but term called missing middle. Got it. So everything from ADUs and granny flats to you know fourplexes. So okay. it's 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 something that's more efficient. You know, usually it's not McMansions, but they're they're smaller units and but they they meet. And that's and some of some of the starter starter homes, some of it's you know things that are just on the smaller side that they don't necessarily need to they can grow into necessarily, but not have to feel like they, there's a lot of upkeep. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mr. Richardson. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Very very much so. A, a report that is readable, and as you can see, has generated some questions and comments, as it should. And that's the whole purpose of it. And, and with uh, Mr. Horton's committee and the housing getting started uh, tomorrow, this is a good place to start from. Uh, excellent place to start from. And my my only other comment, and, and, and I've said this many times over, is family housing, affordable family housing. We have room in our schools for kids. We don't have the kids. We need families. So that's that's my pitch. That's, I mean, short of people like myself who are getting on in our years and still living in our homes and want to continue to living there, it's certainly my plan when the time comes to sell my home to a family. But that's hopefully some years down the road. <laughs> so um, I just think that's important for this city to, to encourage families to come live here and uh, other, you know, that's my issue, but thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Any other comments from the board? Thank you very much. Do you want me to leave this on? Oh, uh, no, sorry, I, I just wasn't sure if you needed me to turn it off or not. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thank it's you. good to see you all. See you on March 20th. Next item B, Tammy DeRosier is seeking to amend an existing CUP number 08-2022 to add enhanced erosion control and ensure safe access to the backyard and return original shrubs and plants 
and various other improvements, including a shed, maintenance to existing structures, landscaping and site maintenance to property located at 14 Westman Street in a residential single family R1 district, assesses map 25, lot 48, C, CUP number 08 2023. Director Mayors. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the applicant was granted a conditional use permit in August 2022 to reconstruct the drainage along the property. Uh, this is old uh, drainage infrastructure that was part of the subdivision. Uh, when it originally got approved, it has actually now formed into a wetlands um, and is un under the jurisdiction of, of, the, uh, of the conditional use permit. So the Conservation Commission has to review this and make a recommendation. Uh, the applicant is now seeking to amend that plan by adding enhanced erosion control for safe access to the backyard by constructing three rock walls in a tiered manner with uh, three foot landings and return original shrubs and plants to the property that had previously been located on the Flynn side of the property. The applicant is also seeking to add various improvements. Basically, this lot is within the uh, entire uh, buffer area. Uh, so anything that Tammy does to her property has to go before the Conservation Commission. So uh, she <laughs> has a laundry list of uh, requests here. Uh, so uh, access strip along the garage, erosion control along driveway, maintenance and rehab of existing flower beds, new flower bed, gravel strip maintenance, foundation repair, deck and repair, front step replace and repair. Uh, the conditional use permit request was required by the Conservation Commission at the January 10th, 2024 meeting. The following recommendations were made by the Conservation Commission. Recommend approval of an item, uh, which was a request to install 10 uh, by 12 foot shed. Uh, with one foot tall wall of rock or timber along the front right for erosion control sur surrounding the plantings. Uh, there was another request to recommend denial of request one and two to amend the previously approved uh, CUP to add enhanced erosion controls by constructing uh, three tiered rock walls and returning to original shrubs and plants uh, to the property as shown in plan one for the following reasons. The work was approved under CUP 8 2022 and it has not been completed. The proposed modifications were required as uh, an engineered design plan set. Request that the original approved plan completed by Norway Plains be completed and native shrubs and ground cover be planted per the plan. Yeah. So staff recommends that the board accept this application as complete and begin the review process. Uh, it was determined at the Conservation Commission that items B through I were ordinary maintenance and they would be exempt from the requirements. All set. Thank you. Uh, entertain a motion to accept the application. Motion Second. made by Mr. Ryder, seconded by Mr. Horton. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Mr. Horton, I invite you to make your presentation. Hi. Are, are we good with the... Okay, so Tammy DeRosiers from 14 Westman Street. Um, like Michelle explained, I was here in August. Um, I had approved, August of 22, had approval um, to do enhancements or to fix the drainage uh, ditch that I have or had along the side of Flynn. Um, I have a corner property, Westman and Flynn Street corner. Um, over the years, um, the the drainage pipe that started at the corner, the very corner just continued to erode, flowing down Flynn. So I had quite a bit of um, quite a bit of a hole there, and it was starting to creep in up against my foundation. So at one point, I only had about four feet between the corner of my foundation down into this into this ditch. So um, pretty dramatic. It, it dropped about eight feet at its at its deepest point, and then about to about six feet so so we got approval the the plan um, the the primary focus of the plan was basically to go from Westman and follow about 50 feet of the hundred foot stretch of this um, so the plan focused on that piece of it and taking care of the ditch that was there the the erosion that was there um, new drainage pipe was put in um, manhole fill everything and that part of it a lot of dirt 
a lot of that is, and that's all done. That was done actually in June of, of this past summer. Um, couldn't do it in, in 2022 because I was waiting for DES to actually approve the plan. That took some time. So in uh, June of last year, that work was done. And again, the focus of that was from the, the outlay of that pipe up to Westman Street. So now that that, now that that is done, it's very apparent that there was a piece which is the backside of the property, which is actually my backyard that would flow into this wetland section, has quite a slope. I now, I now have seven feet before ditch from the corner of my foundation. So I've gained three feet from that corner. Granted, the rest of it is filled all the way to Flynn and is good, but there is still this one part of my corner that is concerning to me. Um, I did not realize the extent of the plans that I needed to follow, but um, what, I'm re what I'm requesting is to build three tiers up that slope, two and a half at its highest point, um, rock tiered walls, backfill it so that I can try to keep any more soil or anything from eroding down and also try to stabilize that that very corner of that of that foundation um that that was my request that i came came with um first part of it um they're two and a half inch two and a half foot walls they run about 20 25 feet long um, there would be three of them the last one would would bring me level with what's there already. Um, and it, it would, the front face of it would be about 12 feet from the corner. So I figured by the time I backfill and, and stabilize, I would have a you know, good 10 feet in that corner that would let me get to the backyard without any concern. So that's my presentation on that piece of it. That, I don't right. know if you have questions. That is, that is one of the things that the Conservation Commission um, did not approve. They're worried about the engineering of it. They wanted me to um, potentially go back to Norway Plains, understandable, um, and have a new plan drawn up focusing on that erosion. At this point right now, I just financially can't. Um, I need to move on and, and deal with other things. So going back to, the, going by, back to Norway isn't an option for me. Um, I was hoping to be able to do it, you know, the best that I can do it. And, you know, they're, they're short walls. I'm not looking to do four-foot walls that would require, you know, it, reinforcement or, or any kind of extra engineering just to build these tiered walls up that, up that slope. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll probably have some questions for you. I'm going to open the public hearing for okay. any public comment. Anybody from the public care to comment on this application? Sir? You, you, you may have a seat right now until the okay. comment section's over. My name is Tim O'Malley. <clears throat> I live at 20 Flynn Street, which is directly across the street from this property. I've, had, I've owned this property since 1976. I've told this board this last year when I was here. <clears throat> I've seen pretty much all kinds of weather conditions from 1976 till now. I will tell you that there is no source of water on this property. The property is low. <clears throat> it does receive water from the city storm drain. The city, the city storm drain has a 15-inch concrete culvert that empties into this. Uh, obviously, the low parts of, of this area will retain some of that water until it either evaporates or goes out to the neighboring property. But there is no source of water. We're not talking about the Great Bay Estuary here. This is, a, this is just a, a piece of land that is low. Uh, <clears throat> this applicant has, has gone through a monumental amount of expense and effort to do what she has done in, <clears throat> through lawyers, survey companies, the DEP, the city boards, uh, and, and I applaud her for it. Everything 
everything that she's done, in my opinion, is an improvement to the neighborhood. The only thing that we perhaps might be lacking is a, is a few mosquitoes and deer ticks. Uh, I have seen the actual plans, and I have viewed a day-by-day -day progress of what has happened there uh, as, as the job progressed. And as I see it, and I did study the plans because I assisted her a little bit in soliciting contractors, uh, as I see it, everything was done to the original plans, and, and in fact, this, the, the plantings were, were even designated on the plans. Uh, I, I guess I would, I would ask you to consider that <clears throat> this land was subdivided, this lot was subdivided from another lot. There was no hardship involved. There was just the application for subdivision, which this city approved, and it wasn't 100 years ago. It was perhaps 12 years ago, I would say. Uh, the city said it was okay for subdivision. Then subsequently, they gave a building permit, which has a full excavation for a cellar. Uh, after that, the property was sold to its first owner, and she went through an appeal to construct a garage, which also has frost walls in it. Uh, beyond that, I would say that this property <clears throat> is, of course, on a, count, on a corner. The water main runs on the inboard side of the property on both Westman and Flynn Street. And this, this city uh, elected to put the water service in the very deepest part of what we're calling the wetlands, which is still wetlands. Obviously, it is a year-round service, so it's got to be three or four feet below what's there right now. Uh, they they could have come in, they could have come in from the Westman Street side and not even really had to do any excavation to the original soil, but they didn't. I just ask you to consider these things. Um, I would I would say <clears throat> this is a little bit off the off the track, but. I've probably had at least 50 supervisors in my working career and when you when you get when you get a little age on you and <laughs> you think back you reflect upon some of those people and the people that I have the most respect for are the people that not not disregarded the rules and the laws but were able to interpret them for the betterment of, in, in my case, for the betterment of production, for the betterment of the product, for the betterment of the workforce, for the betterment of everybody, just as you people are supervisors for this city. You, you have to do the interpretation. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of close in saying that Summersworth has always had a lot of good people. Uh, <clears throat> several of them are, are actually benchmarks to me that have gone before us. Uh, I, would, I would say that Tammy DeRocha is one of the good people that we currently have. And I would ask you as a board not to drive out the good people. We need all we got. We don't, we don't need any more drug dealers or crooks in here. But let's let's try to let's try to keep the good people that we got, keep them in this city, and 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 let them do what they can for their property to to maintain it, to make it better, to make a better neighborhood. Interpret the rules, please. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else care to comment, sir? I'm Jacques Breton. I live at 11 Westman Street, directly across from Tammy DeRosier. And from the time she moved in, that ditch was always a pain, a sore. As time developed, she saw what the erosion was doing to the foundation. There's a clear crack from that past. She stopped, she's stopping it, and she continues to want to stop it. But with that stopping it, 
She also wants to beautify the whole corner that as we drive around the neighborhood, we can at least be proud of that little, those streets there, those neighbors, those houses. And for, I don't know how many of you folks have been in that neighborhood, but it's pretty well maintained. And, you know, there she sits as a real show place. And what she's trying to do in an in, in effort, and I'm helping her, all right? I'm helping her gathering the rocks to build those three levels very cautiously and very slowly so they're, they're properly done from a point where they're, you can jump on them and they're not falling over for fear of anybody wants to think that way. But what's going on is very important for her to continue to get this done and developed so she can sit back and relax and enjoy her backyard. And we as neighbors can also enjoy the fauna that will be there that she wants to put up there. I mean, the plants that she wants to put there have been plants that were there. Most of those plants are sitting in my yard and, and in the ground so we can put them back in there. So consideration of all of the above would be appreciated. And, then, you know, I just say thank you very much for your patience and listening to us. That's all thank I you. Anybody else care to comment? Uh, Director Mears, is there any correspondence concerning this application? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to questions from the board. Mr. Berry. Uh, first things first, you are very lucky. You have really wonderful neighbors. I wish I had neighbors half as good as yours. I believe they're all my direct neighbors. There's only wonderful. another one that couldn't come tonight. But Welcome. Yes, Thank you for joining here us. here to support me. Uh, um, Jack's not kidding. He's helped me log, lug, found me rocks that have come from the neighborhood because it is a wonderful, absolutely wonderful neighborhood that I don't want to leave. But, um, yeah, I don't want to leave. Yeah. You know, there's a phrase, it takes a village. Right? It takes, it, this is a village. And this is yes. one of those cases. Yes. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, so, you know, once again, my apologies to you having to come back to us again, but I understand your hardships. It makes perfect sense to me why you're here. Um, I don't have a problem with anything here. The only thing I, I have is a couple of questions because understand, you know, as a formal, former civil engineer, I look at the wall, mm -hmm. right? So I want to understand more about what you're looking to do because understand typically when we build walls, we require engineering, an engineer stamp basically. Yeah. So can you explain to me in a little bit more detail what exactly you're looking to do? How far are these tiers apart? How tall are they? Yeah. Um, what is the build? Um, how are you securing it? Yeah, so they're, they're small walls. Again, um, I don't want to get into the situation. I've, I have done this, four-foot walls, bracing in the back, you know, dead on level. And that's, I'm, I on purpose am trying to do, I'm doing them or want to do them in tiers to stay away from that type of concern or that type of construction. So two feet to two and a half feet just because of the lay of the land and, and the way that I have to level them out on the base to be able to keep them, you know, running along that, the way the slope is, the way the, the ground is. Um, they're, they're, they're dry fit. They're being locked in by each other, um, backfilling with um, smaller riprap and, and stone to backfill it behind them. They're about a foot, they're about a foot wide themselves. Um, so really locked in from, to, to keep them there and then backfilling them. Um, they're being placed on the slope, so, so this is part of, the, part of the land that was not altered on the plan. So it is the slope that was there. Um, so it's a matter of being able to make sure that area is level and, and placing those rocks on them. They're, again, two to two and a half feet tall, depending on, on the lay of the land, and I'm doing three foot um, landings in between that are filled. Okay, so there'll be no there'll be no motor or anything. So it's just a natural wall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Dry fit. Yeah. It just uh, for me, it's just the concern of you know what if there's a failure in the wall? You know, if someone gets hurt. Yeah. You know, I don't know personally as one board member. I, I I'm okay with the idea, but. I don't know if others would be okay with the idea of having a wall of that nature. And um, I'd love to hear what everyone else would like to say about that. 
Mr. Uh, Horton and then Mr. Rhodes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the uh, the good comments from the neighbors here as well. Uh, a couple things that stand out for me really uh, with Paramount here, I think, is the safe, ex safe access to property, uh, protecting your investment, protecting your house and the foundation, stabilizing the slope, obviously. I, I know it's labeled as wetlands, but really it's a, it's a ditch off the side of the road that you've professionally filled in. You've really gone above and beyond as a homeowner to uh, do the right thing, really, for your property, for the community, and for the neighborhood. So. Um, I have, uh, like Mr. Barry, I really have no problem with what you got going on here. I think you're doing the right thing and you're trying to do the right thing. So uh, I support the uh, the waiver. Thanks. Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Witham. So <clears throat> a little bit of context from what we discussed at the Conservation Commission around this. And I'd like to start this off by saying that um, I am likewise very impressed by the fact that your neighbors are behind you here, that you are trying to absolutely do the right thing here and that you've done a great deal of work to correct a significant drainage issue that was on this property. Um, the Storzgate's property uh, largely, if not entirely, falls within the buffer zone of a larger wetland across the street. Pretty much all of her land is either I have a hundred foot buffer. postage stamp. Yeah. So which puts her in a very difficult position where pretty much if she wants to put a shovel into her dirt, she's gotta be here. Um mm -hmm how that lot ended up getting approved as as buildable is a mystery to me um but that being said we're here she owns a home that was legally built on that lot um and she was left with a pretty horrible situation with the drainage on the property it was causing severe problems and went to the expense of getting an engineered plan and doing the bulk of the work that was marked on that engineered plan um, and came back with a few different requests here. One was, what can I actually do with these other issues on my property? And the commission statement there was, this is correcting existing conditions. We don't need to be involved with this. Another was putting a shed on the property, which technically she needed a CUP for, did without one, but completely of her own volition did pretty much exactly what we would have asked had she come for a CUP on that. So that was the part that we recommended approval of without any concerns. The point where we hit a few concerns was that when I said the vast bulk of the work, that's not all of it. That engineered plan had included grading on that downslope and plantings on that downslope that were intended to stabilize that soil. And those plantings hadn't been completed, and I believe there was some of the grading work that was yet to be done on that section. And what she had raised as concerns here was that that wasn't going to be sufficient to control the erosion on there, not that it hadn't to this point. So the reason that we recommended a denial on that section wasn't that, that we thought her plan to put in these walls was bad. It was that we had an engineered plan that hadn't, an engineer approved designed plan that hadn't been fully completed and what was being asked for was to replace that engineer approved plan with one that was not. So it's not that we thought it was a bad plan, it's that we didn't know and we don't know. Um, if you look at the folks that are on the Conservation Commission, we've got people who are environmental scientists, foresters, me who's capable of taking notes and writing up minutes. We don't have a civil engineer. So we couldn't adequately evaluate the two plans against each other except to say that the one that was approved wasn't 100 percent done and this one didn't have an engineer's signature saying that it was good so that's where our recommendation to deny came from there it's absolutely no judgment on the applicant or her desires and strictly an assessment of the two plans with what limited knowledge we have mr witham as director Mears was reading her staff memo I had to look at the application again I looked up at you because I thought we were building a Walmart super center I'm like what is going on here <laughs> what, what my, my uh, two pages three pages of requests it was 
So, so it is difficult for me because I, I, I am in this position where. Thank you for for making the leap there, right? Because that's where I wanted to go. This is a homeowner. I laugh. I, this I is, would I would argue. This is my version of uh, Section Thirteen with all my flags of things that I think impact me. We're always Not taking applications sure. from the planning board now that you're so well read. Yeah. Um, uh, the, <laughs> Uh, oh, you never know. <laughs> now, I'm glad we could chuckle over it, though. But, you know, this, this is a, a homeowner, as has been articulated by many here, uh, that is trying to do the right thing, trying to follow the letter of the law, uh, that has a property, perhaps should never have been a, a buildable lot, but here we are now, right? And uh, not your fault. Um, and trying to take a bad thing and make it better. Uh, I don't see any reason why we should stand in the way of this. Uh, the fact that your neighbors support what you're doing, heck, are helping you to do what you want to do, uh, speaks volumes, in my opinion. Uh, th th this is pretty simple. I, I, I hear Mr. Rhodes' point about the engineer's plan. If this was something of a larger scale, uh, I, I am definitely in the Conservation Commission's camp there. If this were a Walmart super center, it's not. And as board members, yes, we have our rules, we have our guidance, but sometimes the best guidance we can use is a little bit of common sense. And common sense says to me, let her build the walls, let her put the shed. It, it all just makes sense to me. Um, I hear Mr. Barry's concern about you know, how the wall is going to be constructed. Two-foot wall, I'm not concerned. If a, if a rock falls out, you're going to put it back. Uh, I take care of the ball field up at the Noble Pines, and we have a rock wall that was built in, like, 1942. I found the plans for it. There's an arrow pointing to where it is, and it says, build rock wall here. That's what the plans say, right? And they're all, every now and again, one falls out, and you'll see me up there scratching my head. How does it go back? It's like this quirky puzzle piece. That's what you're going to deal with, right? Um, I am not concerned about this. Common sense prevails here. Mr. Bowman, then Mr. Robitis. Yeah, I, again, not to be redundant, but since everybody else is being redundant, I will be too in some capacity. I think your mistake was probably hiring an engineer in the first place. <laughs> uh, so um, I applaud you. But it is a great plan. I, I would they, not have been able, but yes. Thanks for trying to do everything right. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to approve it. I have no issues. Um, let's, let's just roll it. That's, so just, that, that's pretty much where I'm at as well. Um, at the end of the day, if you've got your foundation that is potentially being compromised or close to being compromised, um, and we don't act to help you fix that, then shame on us. Um, so I'm ready to move on it as well. Mr. Richardson. I think everybody said it very well. I just want to add that if the Aztecs and the Incas can build terraces that have lasted 500, 600 years, I think you can do the same. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. Uh, really quick, just for anybody watching who also watched me on conservation and my fellow members of the Conservation Commission who are wondering why I'm going to vote the way I am tonight, civil engineer said this is okay. <laughs> Any further or questions? Former, at the very minimum, said it's okay. Mr. Horton. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Uh, I move that the conditional use permit for request for Tammy uh, DeRoche. D. D. Yeah. Well, first off, we we have to go through a regional impact. I was gonna, Is there I any was more vote on regional impact? I get a motion on okay. regional impact. Uh, uh, that does that the application does not have regional impact. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Richardson. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed. Motion passes. Uh, waiver request. Entertain a motion. Waiver. Oh. Mr. Rhodes. I uh, move the request of Tammy DeRosier for DeRosier, DeRosier? DeRosier. DeRosier. I uh, want to get this right. For a waiver from Section 9 of the Site Plan Review Regulations requirement to provide fully engineered plans be approved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Any discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Contain a CUP motion. Mr. Rhodes. 
I move at the request of Tammy DeRoche for a after the fact conditional use permit to install a 10 by 12 shed with a one foot tall wall of rock. I'll just skip through the rest of this as written in the staff memo here. Be approved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Conditional use permit is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate Good it. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of work to do. Gotta <laughs> <laughs> find more rocks. Item 4C, Jamie Aldebot is seeking a site plan amendment for a waiver from parking space requirements for motor vehicle services, indoor car detailing business. On a property located at 497 High Street in the residential commercial RC district, assesses map 40, lot 53, condo map 90, lot 53C, ZBA number 2023, number 2023. 20, uh, Director Mayors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 497 High Street was developed in 1990 for a 14,000-square-foot building to create three commercial condo units for 5,000-square-foot Midas muffler and 2,000-square-foot uh, for unspecified service and 7,000 square feet for VIP auto. 52 parking spaces were provided, 12 interior parking spaces uh, unidentified on the plan, and 40 exterior uh, parking spaces. 25 parking spaces were allocated to the subject 7,000 square foot condo unit. 47 parking spaces were required by the site plans during the development of the site. The 5,000 and 2,000 square foot Midas Buffalo and unspecified service area are now occupied by Tire Warehouse and a separate condo unit from the subject area. The 7,000 square foot unit previously occupied by v VIP Auto is now occupied by a, a 3,500 square foot uh, retail use, ETNT, and the proposed 3,500 square foot for motor vehicle service use, indoor car detailing business. This did receive a special exception uh, in January to allow motor vehicle services, indoor car dealing, detailing with the following conditions. All motor vehicle service shall be contained within the building and shall not be done in the parking lot. Uh, and this shall include the washing of cars. Uh, applicant is proposing to split the 7,000 square foot unit to support 3,500 square foot retail and 3,500 square foot uh, motor vehicle service. Uh, the proposed use will require in the following parking spaces per the site plan regulations. Retail use is one space per 200. 3,500 square feet would be 18 spaces. Automotive services, uh, Station, four spaces per bay, 12 spaces would be required. Uh, the total required spaces are 30 uh, spaces for this side of the development. Uh, staff believes that the application is complete and the board can take action. Also, thank you. Contain a motion to accept the application. So moved. Motion second. made by Mr. Richardson, second by Mr. Witham. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? This time I'd like to invite you to make your presentation. Good evening, members of the board. In. My name is Jamie Aldebar. Um, I'm the owner of the Seco Saddle Detailing. Um, basically, I'm trying to, I'm seeking a waiver uh, for parking spaces. Currently, uh, based on the regulations, I should have 12 parking spaces. Uh, but because I have three bay garage, well, this place has three bay garage. I supposed to have twelve, but I'm seeking to run my business with seven, which is the current parking spaces that that we have. Because by numbers, by regulations, AT and T should have eighteen parking spaces, and the parking on that side is twenty five by total. Um, that's what I'm trying to seek, just to a waiver to open my business with seven parking spaces instead of tw uh, 12. Um, the owner already did the maintenance and inspection to the drain also. Um, I have the receipt right here. Um, I don't know if you want me to provide that information right now. I also have the product uh, list that it was uh, requested last time that, it was, uh, that I was here. Um, and that's all I have. 
All set? Yes. All right. At this point, I'd like to open the public hearing. Anybody care to comment on this application? Director Mayors, is there any correspondence concerning this application? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none, close the public hearing. Questions from the board. Mr. Belmore. This went to the SRTC, didn't it? Yes. Were there minutes in the packet? I couldn't find them. Uh, what did the SRTC say? I was uh, going to recap that. Should, okay, if you want to recap it. Uh, they recommended approval um, with a few conditions. All outdoor lighting shall be downlit and fully shielded. The oil and water separator shall be ex inspected yearly by July 1st. Reports shall be submitted to the Department of Development Services, uh, and that's internally within the building. A copy of the completed stormwater inspection and maintenance log shall be provided to the Department of Development Services annually on or before July 1st. This is requirement shall be ongoing condition of approval, and the applicant shall provide a chemical list for review by the Wastewater Division. That's the only question I had. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the project. I'll be looking to support it. Mr. Rubin, I just wanted to recap hey, real quick. We had, had, we had discussed the parking uh, requirements for the size of this business. We also had some um, correspondence or some conversation with the people that owned AT&T, I believe. They have 25 spaces um, assigned to them, which they said they do not use that. Um, so um, in his business, so to speak, uh, there aren't cars that are stacking up that are bro broken down. People drop a car off, they have it cleaned, they pick it up that day. So um, at the end of the day, um, after we had uh, met with the applicant, S SRTC was in full support of passage of this. Mr. Witham? Again, regulations exist. They make sense in some cases. I'm going to let common sense prevail here. I've driven by this property thousands of times. There's never a, a, an issue with parking now, and there won't be after you move in there. So green light. Any further questions on the board? With that. Anybody have a motion for a waiver request? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the waiver request. Second. Motion made by Mr. Belmore, seconded by Mr. Obitis. Discussion? Opposed in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver passes. Thank you so much. Uh, just you. one question. Uh, for the chemical list and the maintenance in cleaning drain. Right the okay, perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Item D, Bill Dubikia LLC is seeking a conceptual review for, a, for an automobile sales use located at 220 and 222 Route 108 in the Commercial Industrial CI District, Assessment Map 61, Lots 10 and 11, site number 02-2024. Director Mayors. Yeah, so the applicant is proposing to redevelop uh, 220 and 222, Route 108, as a full-service car dealership, uh, automobile sales. This will be a phase plan on Map 61, Lot 10, and Map 61, Lot 11. They will be merged. If you remember, this came in for a lot line revision. Uh, and it's sort of a jaggered lot because of the frontage. So it will be remerged. Uh, there is currently a retail strip mall with three units. That lease is complete in September 26th. The applicant would like to demo the Big Dipper uh, on the existing map, 61 lot 10. Uh, oh, oh yeah, okay. Uh, the applicant has provided conceptual plans for discussion. Uh, there will be a number of waiver requests from the site plan uh, review. These are the major waiver requests that are listed. Uh, the landscape design standards, buffer requirement, 100 foot structure and 500 foot or 50 foot for landscape buffer and the rear setback. The applicant is proposing 50 foot setback for the structure and 20 foot for the landscape buffer to accommodate the Route 108 complete streets. When we met with the applicant, we showed them uh, the plan for the complete streets. So they had to go back to the drawing board and redesign the site a little bit. Uh, applicant is seeking feedback from the waiver request. The applicant submitted a conceptual landscaping plan showing an eight uh, foot wide uh, 
vinyl uh, privacy fence with evergreen. Uh, the landscape design standards buffer yard requirement is a class A buffer yard. Class A, no structure either temporary or permanent shall be located closer than 100 feet to the property line. A landscape strip of at least 50 feet wide shall be located in any paved area or abutting property lines, except where a driveway or other essential openings may be required. The landscaping in the buffer yard shall be designed by a landscape architect or arborist. We did sit down with the landscape uh, architect regarding this project. Uh, section uh, 12.7 point B, appearance standards. Um, Kia has a standard uh, standard for architectural design and it's a very modern it doesn't fit within our New England architecture regulations <laughs> uh, section 12.4 point B uh, uh, vehicular and circulation and parking except in the historic mill and downtown portion of the business di district uh, paved areas shall be allowed to be placed into one half the width of the required setbacks as set forth in the zoning or 15 feet. Applicant is proposing less than 15 feet along the side property lines and required to allow permanent drainage infrastructure within one half of the minimum building setback. Uh, I did talk with the applicant. They are proposing this along the rear of the property line. Uh, and there are a number of landscaping waivers that are being requested. So this is just a conceptual uh, review and the applicant is looking for feedback regarding uh, site layout. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite Bill Doobie to make their presentation. All righty, well, Bill Doobie can't be here tonight. Um, for the record, I'm Eric Sowery from All This Engineering here on behalf of the applicant. And I've got a motley crew of characters with me here tonight. I've got Debbie Doobie Reed and Emily, Emily Doobie Gray, obviously from the Doobie family. Um, I have Doug Raymore from Jewett Construction. They're the design build contractor on the project. Uh, he'll be talking about the building. And I've got Vicki Martell from Woodburn and Company. Uh, she is the landscape architect for the project, and she's going to talk about all sorts of plants and fun things like that. So let me turn this on. Priority beep, okay. Okay. Um, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, we're at the northwest corner of Route 108 and Blackwater Road. Uh, this site uh, formerly had a mobile home park on it. Uh, the park was removed in 2018, I think, a few years back. To, yeah, and there, I believe there was a restaurant there at the corner as, as well. I'm, I think it was a Thai place, maybe? I never ate there, so I don't know. Um, and then we had the Big Dipper uh, on the piece of the north, and then there's a small-scale retail strip uh, on the very north end. It's pretty low intensity. Uh, there's a hair salon in there. I think there's a vacuum place. Um, so the site itself is about 4.2 acres. Uh, it's got a lot of frontage on 108 and Blackwater. Currently, it's got seven curb cuts, uh, which is excessive in my mind. Um, we're in the commercial industrial zone. We have water and sewer, which is fantastic for this type of project. Uh, soils are great. It's part of that sand plain that goes all the way to Rochester, so really good soils there. Uh, there we go. Okay, so what we're looking at doing here is a Kia dealership. Uh, the building itself is about 22,000 square feet. It's one story. Uh, it does have a mezzanine section uh, that will have uh, some offices and parts up there. Um, and it has service in the back. Uh, we're looking at a main entrance off of 108 and another curb cut on Blackwater. So bringing the seven curb cuts down to two. Um, it, we have a huge outdoor showroom. Uh, it's not really a parking lot. This is mostly display, which is why you don't see the whole thing covered in parking spaces, uh, which is one of the waivers we're going for. Uh, so what we've got now, we've got parking out here in this section demarcated, parking here, and parking here. And that's for patrons who come in. Maybe they'll get maybe 10 an hour people coming in. It's not a really high-intensity use for patrons, people shopping. It's not a Walmart. They're not going in there to buy a car like a Walmart. Uh, you've got some service, and you've got some employees. So we've got 70 spaces shown. Uh, there's room for 297 on the property. But they, car dealers, as I'm sure you are, like to preserve the flexibility. They might want to put their cars diagonal. They might want to space them out if in inventory is low. They might want to stack them three deep. Um, so having spaces there is actually a little confusing for them and their people. And what, what I found out, which was actually kind of humorous, if they go out and they take a car out for a test drive, a patron might come in and park in that space. And now the car that they've just driven is supposed to be in that space. They don't know where they parked it. It's somewhere else on the lot. They don't know. So if you've striped spaces, people tend to use them. Um, so we're looking for a waiver on that. Um, there are some landscape waivers as well that Vicki will talk about. Um, for buffering, 
We're talking about an eight-foot-tall fence along the back line with extensive plantings. And the first people we met with on the project, before we even sat down with the city, was the owner of the abutting trailer park to the south. And there should be a letter in your packet uh, from them. Um, they are in support of the project. They had some requests. Uh, they wanted a bunch of plantings. They wanted the tree. And they also wanted us to remove a few trees on their property. They've got a couple big bull pines that they're concerned about falling. Legitimate concern. If you get some wind in there, they might come down. So we'll take those down at their request. Um, and their letter indicates that they're happy with the project, uh, which is good. Um, Stormwater, we haven't done the complete design yet, but given the soils, I'm assuming it's going to be an inf infiltration system. Uh, I think I'm going to use every single one of these islands as a little stormwater feature, so we don't need any curbing. So it's sort of like, like a mini rain garden, every single one. And all that water will go towards the back uh, after being treated, if it doesn't infiltrate, to another system along the back line there. Um, other site features going through it, uh, we've got a triple dumpster pad here. There's also a little concrete pad there for a future generator. Uh, we're not sure if it's going to be part of this proposal yet, but we're going to put it there, get it on the plan, and also run the conduit to it just to plan for the future. And there's also a pad back there for a container where they're going to store batteries. Uh, a lot of EVs now, you've got a lot of batteries, more than they used to have. Um, as far as service goes, they've got, this is the main entrance, so you drive in, the door opens, you drive your car, and the door closes behind you, so you get out of your car, out of the rain, out of the snow, um, and then you go into the into the lounge if that's what you want to do. And this is the big thing with dealerships now. They've got a nice, well-appointed lounges on the interior of the building, get a coffee or whatnot. Uh, there's the two main doors on either side is where the cars will be entering and exiting. There's another door here. I don't think they're going to use that one this much. And there's three doors here for car washes. So they're going to do all the car washing internal. Uh, they intend to keep those doors closed uh, at all times unless, of course, a car is going to be coming and going. Uh, utilities, as I said, we've got water sewer. Uh, so the design of that is pretty much done. Uh, we're pretty happy with it. So we think we've got what we need there. Uh, we're going to have water and electricity come from Blackwater. Sewer and gas are going to come from 108. Uh, lighting is going to be a little more intense, obviously, for, you know, it's a car dealership. One of the waiver requests in front of you is talking about uh, night lights. We don't want to turn the lights off completely at night. We've got millions of dollars of inventory there. So for security purposes, they want to dim the lighting by two-thirds. So typically back before we had LEDs, they would leave, you know, if you had like three or four lights on a single pole, they'd turn off three or four or two or three of them and leave one on, similar to that. So the lighting level will be reduced, but it won't be completely off. Um, and everything is sort of facing 108 uh, versus towards the back. I don't think we have any light poles at all along the back line. That's for the, the abutter. We want to be considerate of their needs. Um, let's see. What else do we have? We did look at DOT. Uh, meeting with Michelle uh, was... Uh, uh, an interesting meeting. Uh, we did not anticipate uh, such a robust DOT project uh, right in front of, of our front door here. It did have significant impacts. Uh, they haven't finished the design yet. I couldn't get the CAD out of them, but I did drop their PDF of their concept, and we had to push the entire site towards the bottom of the plan. Uh, originally, I think we had 10 feet. Now we've got 25 feet along the front, so we had to move the thing 20 feet, uh, which is quite a bit of impact. Um, it remains to be seen how that's going to really affect um, the final design. I'm trying to pushing DOT. I've been asking them for a month to get a scoping meeting. It's been a month. Can't even get a meeting. Um, but we hope to, you know, have a discussion with them about what they're going to want us to do in terms of, you know, planning for the future so that we don't do any, uh, something here that's really going to shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Vicki now to talk about landscaping. Then I'll turn it over to Doug to talk about the building. Then we can go through the waivers and questions. Good evening, I'm Vicki Martell from Woodburn and Company Landscape Architecture. So I have a preliminary concept, concept landscape plan for you here, so I haven't called out tree species and things like that yet, but I'm giving you an idea of where I have shade trees, where I have ornamental trees and planting. So to run through this with you, we've got perimeter trees around the outside of the parking lot. I'll just, you can see. <laughs> hmm? Keep clicking? Yeah, oh, go. oh, there we go. Okay. So around the outside of the parking lot, we have shade perimeter trees. For the most part, I do have a couple places where we have ornamental trees. Here we're just getting a little bit close to the overhead power line, so I want to keep those trees a little bit lower. Um, in terms of the other perimeter landscaping, I do have areas, it's a little hard to see on the projection, but you can probably see it on the plan in front of you, areas where we have lower shrubs and perennials. So I totally understand that 
in most cases, you'd want to buffer those cars and the view of those cars, parked cars from the roadway. Um, in this case, those cars are inventory and the dealership is looking to sell them. So the idea here is that we'd sort of be strategic. We wouldn't have that type of planting everywhere, but we'd have it in select places to make the dealership look a little bit more handsome. They would be low and ornamental. The cars would still peek through. We wouldn't be obscuring the view completely, but we'd still be making a nod to your desire to have a bit of separation there. And then on the inside, we've got a shade tree on each island that we have. Um, we didn't do one here because we're looking to have a sign on one side, and there's also a bit of a four-way traffic intersection there, so we want to keep the visibility there as best as we can. And then to the bottom of the lot, as Eric had talked about, this development has really been squeezed in terms of the original width of the lot and then trying to accommodate that complete street so we don't have a huge area to buffer there, but I'd like to plant that robustly with evergreens. And my hope is that evergreens in conjunction with the fence will give the residences down here more protection than they have now. Right now, they're basically open to 108. So once we have that solid fence with the evergreens in front of it, I think they'll have a lot more sound attenuation and protection from that street than they have now. So it's certainly a relief in terms of the width of that buffer, but I do think that this will be pretty effective in giving them some separation from this development. If you have any questions about landscaping, I can answer them now, or we can turn it over and talk about architecture. All right. Good evening. Doug Remore with Jewett Construction, for the record. Um, yeah, moving to the building itself, um, as you can see, as Eric suggested, not exactly a New England-style cottage. Uh, but it is a pretty sharp looking building. Um, we have uh, bands black ACM uh, across the top and a mix of an, uh, insulated metal panel as well as EFIS on that gray color that you see uh, in compliance with Kia's national brand standards. Uh, we have pretty limited uh, wiggle room when it comes to design of the, the building, the colors, um, the massing itself. Uh, you see a lot of uh, glass storefront in the front, uh, which reveals kind of this uh, contrasting warmth on the interior. So it's not just a uh, modern black and gray uh, structure, but uh, there is a good amount of warmth and wood tones that come from the inside and kind of break that up. Um, in terms of height, uh, the building complies uh, with the height standards and uh, that front raised por portion where you see the Kia logo. Um, serves as a parapet that also uh, sh shields future rooftop mounted equipment. Um, as you can see, as Eric kind of pointed to, there's a dual uh, service drive to the right uh, facing the street. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it back to Eric to summarize the waivers. All righty. Um, I counted 15 waivers total which seems like a lot, but a lot of them are interrelated. Um, you all sell it the screen? What's that? You all sell it the screen? Uh, well, let me bring it back to, oops, wrong button. Bring it back to the site plan. Um, the first one's talking about the required number of parking spaces. This particular use, as I said, is not a Walmart. It doesn't need tons of parking. There is no automotive dealership use in the table to calculate the number of parking spaces, so what we're required is based on the square footage as a retail use plus the number of bays. So we end up with, with a substantial, I think it's like a, can't read it, can't read it from here. Uh, I think it's like 115 required. Uh, we're showing 70, but as I said before, we have a space for 297 compliant spaces. So the space is there, they just don't want to paint it. Uh, they, they feel it's really not conducive to their needs. And that has a ripple effect through the rest of it. it uh, if we give a waiver on the parking spaces, it changes the number of shade trees required. Um, let's see. There's a waiver for a longitudinal parking island, uh, which would be an island running this way here and another one in here. Uh, makes things difficult to plow and also eats up the space uh, where DOT has kind of already scrunched us a little bit. Um, originally, we started with just the lot on this side where the trailer park and the Big Dipper was, uh, but it just wasn't large enough, so they sought out the additional piece, uh, just trying to make this work. I mean, they, they have a number of, of spaces that they need to really make this dealership function. Um, I talked about stormwater and turning each one of these landscape islands into a stormwater feature. Can't do that with curbing, so that's why I have a waiver request for curbing. That's pretty, pretty easy. Um, number of shade trees along the perimeter. Uh, I think Vicky can talk about that if you want to. If you want to dig into that, um, 
There's a waiver request for screening between the front and side parking lots in the street. That's a, an OPEG screen. I think it's up to three, three and a half feet high, as I recall, along with a berm, which, again, not conducive to the use. You want to see the wares that are for sale. It's a car dealership. Um, sidewalks, well, DOT is going to build them. So there's no sense for us to do it only to have DOT come back and tear them out and move, it every, move everything. So it didn't make sense to, to really do that now. Um, reduced buffer yard, uh, again, this is uh, being scrunched by DOT. Uh, we have substantial buffer yard along the front now. It's actually 45 feet between the parking and the edge of pavement on this side at about 36 here. DOT is going to eat into that, unfortunately. Uh, but it will be a better intersection, and we are scrunched over here just a little bit. Uh, but most of the Blackwater Road improvements, at least from what I can tell now from the plan, DOT is going to be doing the majority of that work on the Cumberland Farm side. So that, that's good. So a lot of that green space will be preserved. Um, Doug talked about the building not being compatible with New England design features. Obviously, it's a standard building from Kia. Uh, they really aren't going to give a lot of flexibility in changing that. It's a branding thing for them. Um, <coughs> Metal siding and long expanses of broken roof, as well as EFIS, again, relate to the building and the fact that it is prototypical of the, the tenant itself, uh, or the, the, I guess it would be the franchise. Um, RT, RTUs, I asked for that waiver anyway. We're still, you know, the building is still in flex, um, but the building does have a parapet around it. You know, RTUs, that's the rooftop units, won't be necessarily screened, but the parapet will serve to do that. So you're going to get the same effect. We just don't need to build a fence on the roof. So you can't see them. So why, why build it in this case? Um, and then lighting I talked about. Uh, whoops, went too far. Uh, allowing a minimal level of light at night. Uh, the regulations now require everything to be shut off. I believe it's an hour after closing or something like that. Um, so a minimal light for security. And then drainage infrastructure within one half of the required uh, minimum setback. Normally, I would put some drainage up front along the strip, but DOT is going to eat away into that, so I needed to put everything into the back. So aside from the stuff in the parking lot, so that pushes into that half of the setback. Unfortunately, otherwise I'd be able to split the difference. So that's kind of a, a ramification of DOT. So what we're here for tonight is just some feedback from you guys before we really spend a lot of time and do a lot of math and hard design. Um, see what you guys think. If any of these are a hard no, I'd like to know, you know, before we go ahead and, and, and spend that time. Uh, any other feedback, constructive or not, we'd love to hear from you And before we actually uh, get into this and come back. So any questions, please have at it. Everyone is available to answer questions. I also have the doobies available as well if you want to ask them about any operational questions. Questions from the board. Mr. Witham. High level. Um, I like the project. Uh, I like the look of the building. You know, it, it's, it's interesting when it comes to design standards. Uh, we have wrangled uh, at this board level and have contemplated a change to our uh, requirement for that New England style architecture, particularly in the Route 108 corridor. Uh, I think you're hard pressed to find a building out there or many that meet that criteria. I, I, I would so, agree with you. The, the, uh, the rules are more for downtown. And correct, that. right. So uh, I would argue that a New England style building out there would stand out more than this one. So, <laughs> right. uh, so I, I, I like the look of the building. Uh, you know, I, I think your concern for the abutting uh, mobile home park uh, is a good one. I am thrilled that you reached out to the owner of the park and engaged them in a conversation. I saw that as perhaps one of our bigger hurdles here. I appreciate the fence and the aggressive plantings and all of that. I think that is going to help this uh, markedly. Uh, I can appreciate the need for some level of lighting with millions of dollars of inventory at night. Um, typically, when we get our plan sets, when we get to that stage for the formal submission, there's going to be a, 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 a site plan that shows the lumens yep. on the ground. I would appreciate that for both. Oh, yeah. Full lighting and then the uh, reduced lighting, just to kind of show that. And certainly want to make sure that there's no wash of that onto the properties behind. Uh, which Absolutely, that that, that's illustrate. a good suggestion. So not often does that lumen map matter a lot, but it matters a lot here. Okay. So I think those two would be helpful. Um, you talked about... The garage doors, there's a few on the back side that you intend to keep closed. 
That's the intent. Yeah, yeah. it's the the building is going to be intent, heated. But reality is is difficult. Uh, wash bays maybe not as loud as mechanical bays. So I appreciate that we're putting those back there, but. If there was a way to configure that differently, that would be great, but I don't know if there is, right? But wash bays are better than mechanical bays just from a noise attenuation perspective. I don't know if your dealership is gonna be like a lot of new ones now where the uh, service bays are climate controlled so that overhead doors are typically closed anyways. But They're looking at that, that, okay. that is a concern. I mean, it's so, most certainly gonna be heated, so yeah, nine so months out of the year, they're so, gonna so wanna keep it closed. That, that noise traveling yep. is perhaps a bigger issue than the light, quite frankly. Yeah. So, from, from what I understand in going through this, um, I, maybe Emily can shed some light on this, but a, a lot of the mechanical equipment is, is it's a lot quieter than it used to be. We've heard that, yes, and yeah. I tend to believe that's true. Yeah. So, uh, my final point, uh, at least for now, again, I, a high level, I like this project. Uh, I'm generally in support of the waivers that you're looking at here. I would just flag that we will have a robust discussion around the sidewalk. Uh, I agree with you 100%. makes no sense to build the sidewalk that's going to get torn up in a, a few years, right? Uh, however, uh, long term, uh, the city is going to be required to maintain those sidewalks, and maintain means plow in the wintertime, which we have intentions on doing. Our current sidewalk tractor fleet is not big enough to, we don't have enough of them to do that as a route in and of itself, so we're on the hook to buy another sidewalk tractor. Oddly enough, sidewalk tractors cost like a quarter of a million dollars. Don't ask me why, but they do. So what we've asked applicants to do on the Route 108 corridor, you wouldn't be the first, is to calculate out what the sidewalk cost okay. and then contemplate a contribution to that fund somewhere between zero and what the cost of the sidewalk would be. So uh, we don't hold your feet to the fire what that should be, but okay. we'd, we'd like to engage in a conversation around that uh, if willing. That's all I have. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Horton and Mr. Rhodes. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. A couple of con uh, pros here to start with, uh, bringing additional jobs to the community, which is a great great win, adding to the tax base. I do like the uh, the appearance of the structure. It is consistent with the uh, other dealerships on the, on the route. Uh, I'm good with landscaping. Things, uh, things as mentioned that would concern me as well is the neighboring uh, folks in the back there, really, and the doors in the back. So we've recently had other other folks come in that uh, have had problems with noise spillage off into their properties, and uh, it's been a big deal, really. And also on that property, they did have an eight-foot vinyl fence, which, from their feedback, was not helpful to uh diminish the noise factor so okay something to consider there okay. I, I don't know if a wood a wood fence would eight foot wood fence would be better in addition to you know plantings but uh just something there to consider uh i agree too that the uh lighting plan should show regular hour lumens as well as diminished lumens um and overall i think it's a great project and redevelopment for the site so i'm, I'm good with it Mr. Rhodes. Uh, Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Horton pretty much nailed my comments on light there. Uh, in terms of the sound component there, uh, there's another development on uh, 108, one on High Street that we've had consistent complaints around noise from, which is where that's coming from with you. Um, Anything in particular? Do you know what it, what is causing mechanical it? Mechanical noise from mechanical noise. Okay. has mechanical noise. been what's been the killer on those. Okay. Um, the inclusion of the fence and substantial evergreen plantings there, I would hope, would have some uh, beneficial effect. What we're probably going to want to dig into there is some of the operational concerns around yep. keeping doors shut, the types of bays that are in the back, to try to keep that to a minimum. Uh, it's been a consistent issue with a few other folks, and through no fault of your own, the wall's been poisoned. So um, a piece that'll take some scrutiny there. Um, in terms of uh, the design standards, uh, just to add on to what Mr. Wedeman said, the, the low-intensity retail that you mentioned that was near the old Big Dipper building, um, is actually New England architecture, and it does stand out like a sore thumb on that chunk of 108. So uh, if anything, this waiver brings this property more into connection with the appearance of that section than it currently is, which is strange, but there we are. Um, in terms of the landscaping, I'm very encouraged by what you've indicated around the inclusion of these islands as almost miniature rain gardens. 
throughout the property. Um, I think you're doing a, a very good thing with that, particularly where you're constrained around what DOT is going to do with 108. Um, in terms of the landscaping plan, I think it's more extensive than we've seen for a lot of automotive uh, properties in the area, and I'm very encouraged by that as well. I think you're striking a great balance between um, trying to meet the appearance standards that are developed by that and the landscaping standards in place and maintaining it as a functional automotive property. Um, so very encouraged to see that in terms of species. Uh, we do have a suggested tree list. I'm sure Michelle's out ahead of me on that in the conversation there, uh, but just call back to that. Um, in particular, we've had a few automotive places put honey locust on there, which seems crazy and will drive your lot boys insane if you do that. So hopefully that's not in the plans. Um, in summation, I think we're looking at a really good plan in a chunk of property on 108 that's had a lot of vacancy over the past few years. So I'm very encouraged by what you're doing. Um, I'm very hopeful that we'll come to a, a quick decision on this when it comes up for a full review. Um, I would just say it's good that you're talking to the DOT now uh, because all I can say there is good luck. Um, <laughs> we're, we're trying to talk to the DOT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hate to discourage you, but I think we've got one project that's been into this for two years. At least. With DOT. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So good that you're banging on the door now because yeah. they might answer sometime in 2026. Yeah. Uh, good luck there. But <laughs> very pleased to hear where you're headed with this and uh, nothing but good things here. Thank you. Mr. Richardson and Mr. Berry. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have no problem with the parking plan that you have and nobody's mentioned that yet, but I don't think they do either. Um, the lot is designed for what you're using it for. Uh, I do want to applaud you for your... Uh, what I think is really an aggressive landscaping. Uh, I, I had my first thought was, don't they want their vehicles seen? <laughs> and one of you alluded to that. Um, but, you know, the, the, it, it's a good plan. And especially on the north end of it with your with the neighbors that are on that side right now, that whole area is wide open. And now you've broken it up with the plantings along that north side. So I think that's a definite plus and, you know, I know the people driving down from Rochester in that direction, maybe they won't see the vehicle so much, but most of them are going to be on the other side anyway. But, you know, I think that the way that breaks up that lot from what's your, what your next door neighbors are going to be, that's a good thing. So aesthetically for us all. So I appreciate it and wish you well. Thank you. Mr. Barry and then Mr. Belmore. All right. And actually, I'm going to piggyback your thought here, Mr. Richardson. I'll tell you, when I'm driving down the road, I see the dealership. I, I don't see the cars. I see the dealership. And that's going to be the thing that's going to be prominent. It's going to be Ford. That's the sign. It's the, that's the sign. Yep. Exactly right. But once I see that, then I'll look down at the cars. So I'm, I'm sure most people will see the name on the side of the building first. So not a huge deal to me. Um, personally, I like the project. Um, compared to what's there, this is a big improvement. Oh, yeah. Very excited about that. Um, lots of things I really, really like about the project. Um, I'm thrilled that you guys are going with uh, infiltration. The engineer in me loves that. I will always sign up for, uh, for um, underground drainage. Um, uh, as far as the lighting, I do agree uh, that I would like to see the daytime the, and the nighttime and all that lighting that you guys are looking to do. I will say as a musician, I do go through that area all the time at late hours. And I'll tell you, there is a lot of light bleed. Cumberland, Cumberland Farms, they keep their lights on all night. And the lights across the street at the Kyoto is also on all the time. So there, there's a lot of light coming in. So um, certainly what they're doing will not make it worse. Okay. But um, it's always good to have it controlled, right? Because it's it's for the neighbors in the back, yep, right? Absolutely. Don't worry about the guys to to the next door, right? Because they're they're a business. You're not keeping them up, right? Um, yeah. Beyond that, I really like it. I, I have no problem with your waivers. Um, so far, I'm I'm excited to see what your final your final plan looks like. Right. Yeah. Ms. Belmore. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of comments, maybe a question. Um, devil's in the details, but. I'm probably good with all the waivers, for what it's worth. Um, based on some of the other comments, because of a couple other projects, again, buffering the noise from the uh, manufactured housing, trailer park, if you will, is very important. And making sure, I, s I assume like new dealerships, you, you, the doors automatically open and then close automatically. I'm getting a yes. Yeah, that's important. That's uh, that was troublesome, and another one that butted a neighborhood. Uh, quite frankly, the Firestone on uh, 
high street at Butts and Neighborhood. Um, so the noise component and getting those doors down is, is uh, really paramount to keeping the noise at a, uh, at a very low level. Um, one thing in regards to uh, what's happened in, in some of the other projects is when you go on any test drives, you know, somebody's going to test drive a vehicle. Um, if you're going down Blackwater Road, which you might have to be doing, what we really don't want you to do is going to some of the side neighborhoods. Okay. Uh, we get complaints. You stay on the main thoroughfares, but if you're going down Blackwater, when you get to Old Rochester Road, it's 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 a uh, it's a tough intersection. A lot of accidents. So be very cautious uh, with your team and okay. and. and when you go up for those test drives, that's going nice. in that area. And then just one quick question was in regards to uh, dealerships doing anything special now? Do we have EV charging stations yep. for things on the lot? There's two charging stations outside, one interior in the service department, and we're wiring up or providing conduit for two additional. So by the end of the day, a couple of years now, there'll be five. And is there anything special you're doing to uh, partner with uh, fire departments in case there's a fire with those batteries they are tough to put out? Well, I mean, the, the batteries themselves are stored in that container, which is away from the building. So it's not a threat to the building. So we wanted to isolate that. And it's in a steel box. So hopefully it won't be an issue. Now, this is going to have to go through technical review anyway. Yep. Uh, so okay. we'll see if they have any special provisions. We'll see what we can do to address them. Okay. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mr. Robertus, Mr. Haberman, you all set? Mr. Haberman? Yeah, again, on the, uh, on the bay doors in the back, I believe you have four Yes. So one goes straight through, and you have two wash bays. Uh, yeah. Three, I, three wash bays. Three wash bays. Yep. So uh, what I saw for the landscape plan, you had about 19 feet from the asphalt to the property line. A pro on that area, yeah, that's about yeah. right. Yeah. So from the area of view on page one, there's about four or five uh, manufactured homes there, and those look pretty close as well. So. Again, concerned because we've had we've experienced this, yep. Yep. and we're only looking at maybe sixty feet. So that's pretty close. So, again, express that concern. But the project looks great. But uh, for the board, yeah, we're concerned about that. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Oh, this this was definitely helpful. Absolutely. We, yeah. This is this is great. It is for the record. I'm a big fan of the conceptual review, particularly on projects of this scope. I yeah. think it little helps. Little tiny ones, no, but ones like this for sure. Right. Saves you a lot of money. You don't have to design things three times. So. Item E, Adam Johnson is seeking a conceptual review for multifamily development located at 10 Green Street in the Business BH District with historic overlay. Assesses Map 10, Lot 172, Site Number 03-2024. Director Mears. Yes, yeah, so the applicant is proposing to add two additional units to existing 12-unit uh, multifamily site. Uh, it's served by existing on-site uh, parking lot with 14 spaces. Uh, the law is subject to parking and access easement that benefits 67 Elm Street, the Summersworth Hotel. The applicant uh, is looking to discuss the parking plan associated with adding additional residential units to the existing building because this will need a waiver from our parking regulations. Uh, two residential spaces are required per unit. Uh, this property is located in a business with a historic overlay, form base codes, area four, and it's located just outside uh, the downtown special parking overlay. So this is just, again, a conceptual design for discussion. At this point, I'd like to invite uh, Adam Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Johnson, and I'm here on behalf of the owners of the property at 10 Green Street, as noted. Uh, to request conceptual review of our proposal to add two new residential units to the existing multifamily property. Um, as you know, as you're, I'm sure, well aware, the ongoing need for quality housing uh, highlights the, the ongoing demand as well for residential units for this purpose. As noted, we're also uh, requesting a waiver of the, the parking requirements. Um, the plan highlights 22 spaces 
two of which are allocated per the easement to the adjoining property, adjacent property. And uh, that would be a net parking space of a count of 20 for the 10 green use, um, which is a, a ratio of approximately 1.4 spaces per unit. And uh, conceptual plans were, were submitted for review. Um, we're ultimately looking to maintain the fidelity of the envelope of the property, the outside of the building, um, and use unpurposed and underutilized space within the existing property to in, uh, implement this development. <coughs> so if there are any questions, concerns, feedback, I'd be happy to hear them, address them if I can, and if not, bring them forward. Questions on the board? Mr. Witham. <clears throat> if Director Mears could help with the whole parking thing, I'm, uh, maybe it's the hour, I don't understand. Uh, so he's before us because uh, it would require 28 spaces, and there, so he would need a waiver from parking. How, how many does he have now? Uh, I think it was 14. Correct. 14 spaces. 14. So we're adding two units, so we have to add 14 spaces? We're, we're already shy some, is that? Yes, we're already shy some. Got it. And, and, right, and, so then, and then there's an easement for 67 Alan. We we'll yeah. start with the shyness piece, right? So we're, 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 we're under by a lot already before we even contemplate these units. Was that perhaps because when this was originally constructed as apartments, the parking standards were different uh, and did not require as many, or was there a waiver to have fewer to begin with? I will have to look into that uh, question. I think there was a waiver. Okay. I've got an idea. Was it elderly housing? So maybe they contemplated. Well, this is conceptual review. I just I would like to flush that out. You know, it's, it's and here's the other thing that strikes me about the property right now. It, I've not recognized a parking issue with that property. Uh, my gut tells me adding two spaces is not going to exacerbate that because it doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, what does become an issue do, do, with with the Summersworth Hotel destined for demolition? If you've driven by today, it's fenced off, and we're heading in that direction. Um, the in the redevelopment of those sites, the 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 uh, the ability to park there still will exist. That doesn't go away. So it's deeded, as I understand it. The Correct. easement provides access to the back of the hotel. Historically, as I understood it, to provide access for maintenance purposes. Got it. Um, the hotel being gone, the easement remains currently. So we would allocate two of the proposed new yeah. parking spaces. So it's spaces not like we're parking cars there. I was gonna say, I've not seen that <laughs> happen, but you could, with this, potentially do that. They may, the, the new owners may. Uh, that being said, again, we're allocating two of the spaces that are proposed to be developed for that purpose uh, with a you know, net increase for our purposes, additionally, of eight new spaces. So. Now, is this uh, under the- oh, for now. You. Was this under the auspices of the Housing Authority? Because I know in the past people had been referred to it by the Housing Authority. Not explicitly. There are residents that are um, client. So the market rate apartments? Correct, yes. Okay. We have some Housing Authority voucher holders in the property as tenants, but um, it's not subsidized. Okay. Mr. Horton. Yeah, um, so going back to your last page there, here on the parking illustration, um, I think you cur I currently counted 10 spaces on site now. So I guess where are you coming up with the four? So two off site? Is that what you So currently there are four at, on a lower level, which okay. are proposed to remain. Okay, the gotcha. revisions are for the upper sure. parking area. And is your intent to build up that upper, build out that upper parking lot? Uh, Grounds do not need to be expanded. Uh, there's some brush that would need to be removed, okay. and paving would be um, would be done to facilitate the paved parking requirement. I guess my concern there was, as I, I just from my just a quick glance, it just didn't seem like there was a whole lot of space to be building out additional parking spots. So, mm -hmm. I guess that was just my observation and slash concern. So, sure, uh, I'm good if if you can work out. Um, Additional parking with an offsite with uh, 67 Elm Street, you know, to to get your parking needs met there. I'm I'm kind of good uh, going that route as well. So, um, 
I think if you kind of come to some sort of solution in that sense, uh, I'm good with it. So, yeah. Mr. Obajas and then Mr. Rhodes. So I think that um, Councilman Witham had, had made a point that he hasn't seen a parking problem there. I think Housing Authority had is issued vouchers for there. I think it was predominantly housing more elderly population. Um, so that's probably why there weren't cars there. So if that's going to end up going to a market rate uh, building, so to speak, um, people are going to have cars and they're going to need to park them. So I think we need to keep that in mind that we, we need parking um, as well. So we're going to have an overflow. We've got that other project coming in, and I think some of that traffic is going to also probably some of that will end up parking off site as well. So I just want to make sure that we don't end up jamming that. Um, that neighborhood up. That's all I have. Understood. Okay. Thank you. May I just address one piece of that? Sure. Um, and I, I obviously share the concern um, with regard to the current model of, of tenants that were were sort of inherited from prior ownership. There's only a small number of them that were housing voucher holders as of late. That was likely the different years in, in the past. Um, that being said, where there are one bedroom units, we have typically one uh, one adult living in that vicinity, not to say that's always going to be the case, that's a fair concern. Um, but the rental model really facilitates accessibility for young professionals, retirees. Um, it's not typically a, a rental model that we have families coming and going, but um, the concern is, is well heard and well appreciated, so we'll certainly take that under planning. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes? Um, I agreed that my real only concern here is around the, the total parking count. I'm having a little bit of trouble following this, probably because it's late in the evening and my brain's a little full. Um, so currently we've got 12, 12 units, 14 spaces. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. You're proposing to add two new units. Based on the sheet you provided with parking out here, it looks like there's 18 spaces mapped, but one of them is awfully small. So we're talking about adding two units and really adding three spaces? So the total parking would be 22 spaces, which includes the existing parking down below that's not reflected because it's a different elevation. Um, the proposed on modifications to parking would be in the upper lot that's reflected there. Um, I apologize if the, the dimensions are askew, but they are intended to be the same, okay. consistent to meet regulations across the parking lot. So we're, the proposal here is to go from 12 and 14 to 14 and 22. Correct. So Two of which are allocated to the adjoining property as so part of the easement. So it's really 14, 20, but going from 12, 14 to 14, 20. Correct. So mm -hmm. if my math is right, you're taking an existing situation that isn't a parking problem but requires a waiver, going to a new situation that would still require a waiver but would be closer to compliance than it is today. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. I, I fail to see the problem. I have a question for Director Mears. Uh, how does this affect the 85 Elm Street project? Because they're kind of jockeying for parking spots. Also, I think Mr. Robitas uh, kind of alluded to that as far as that project. Uh, actually, the applicant has been in discussion with the owners of 67 Elm because the demo is happening. They're still trying to keep the two spaces, from what I understand, uh, but on, on the site of uh, this site. Uh, but I don't know how it would, would affect that because they're going to have lease agreements. And uh, I actually had a discussion with them today. They're uh, working on the parking spaces that are on uh, Fayette side, which there's an easement over. They're working with the property owners that have the easement over that to try and get those spaces back towards Elm Street. Now, do you, Elm do Street you, project. Do you also own 2 Pleasant Street? No, sir. Because in the past, I think the owner of 2 Pleasant Street and 10 Green Street were the same. And I think the 10 Green Street would also park in the Two Pleasant uh, parking lot. So that may be the case. But, not, but you're, you're separate. Familiar. You're separate right. from that now, yes. right? Yes, that's correct. And Mr. Horton. Yeah, just one last comment. Uh, I guess I would like to see too, upon approval of the plan, that we address some of the falling curbing going on at the property and and just really get some groundskeeping that could probably use some attention as well there. So that's all certainly. I some improvements are planned. Obviously, there's a historical consideration for the exterior yeah. uh, building work, but that certainly um, will be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Witham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. You, 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 you got to where I was trying to go and couldn't get there. 
we have a non-compliant situation with the waiver it's still non-compliant but it's closer to compliance so we're, we're this would actually make it better so that's a good step um, off-site I think is uh, if if there was the need to have even more parking spaces and we could debate that long into the night off-site arrangements with other property owners is is the way to go uh, that's exactly what 67 Elm Street did uh, between the city and other uh, places so uh, those are options uh, available to you uh, as well uh, with with a tight parking situation uh, the one factor that I would hope to see on a formal plan submission would be uh, some uh, either identification of where snow storage would be or a plan for how that would be removed so because you not this winter but other winters you're all of a sudden going to eat up two three sparking spots with a pile of snow so absolutely so we need, we need to be can be mindful of that fair so. enough we will reflect that on future plans thank you very much mr richardson just on a, on a, i'm agreeing with everything that's been said but just on another subject you've really done an interesting job of carving out two units and the location that you put them in so I'm not sure if anyone's been in that, for that. <laughs> if you've ever been in the building it's quite the, the basement's quite interesting yeah uh, there's almost exclusively ledge around the, the circumference of the the habitable space or hopefully future habitable space um, I'm not sure if they just lost their <laughs> initiative to to cut it out or blast it out but uh, it almost rings the basement perfectly and uh, it's quite a sizable space that walking in it's almost sort of a it just hits you in the face why wouldn't we utilize the space for something other than storage of a few boxes and tools and materials so here we are but I'll bring some pictures for the next presentation mr. Haberman yeah on the uh, <laughs> page uh, a2 on the plan I'm assuming that bathroom off the laundry room is for the other residents that live further up the second or third story uh, no sir it's actually it's an existing restroom that is intended for I think maintenance staff currently oh okay it's there today I'm not quite sure why or what the origin was but um, yeah. it's in use for that's why I was looking at it go oh, what's it, what are they using yeah. that for yeah it's exclusively for I think staff or um, contractors not for residents it is locked off but um, it exists nonetheless so trying to capitalize on what's already there for plumbing wise okay thanks Mr. Rhodes, uh, not really pertinent to the plan, but just potential red flag with that bathroom in the basement. Um, when my wife and I were looking to move into this town, we specifically targeted older buildings because we just like old houses. We found a number of them in the city that had what we later found out were often referred to as Pittsburgh potties. Um, bathrooms in the basement that were intended for usually industrial workers coming home from a, a shift to get cleaned up before they went upstairs to the rest of the family a lot of those had significant problems so if you're dealing with one of those you might want to take a look and see if it's a potential problem for this site thank you for that <laughs> any further questions <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I appreciate all of you. I know you're probably beyond your hours, but it's been very helpful. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Item F, any new business before the board this evening? Good answer. Workshop business. Item A, revision of subdivision regulations, Chapter 22. Director Mayors. Sorry. Uh, the planning board will take into consideration lighting recommenders, recommendations provided by the site review technical committee. Generally, lighting for safety shall be provided at all intersections at the distance along the street of not less than 400 feet. Oops, sorry. Uh, standard Eversource light poles, fixtures, decorative or traditional shall be used for street lighting, and street lights shall be LED bulbs. And so those were the uh, 
two things were, that were asked to be added. Question? Mr. Belmore. Did I ask for something regarding bonding? To just, 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 just to clean it up a little bit? Was that done? I think uh, it was bonding. I can't remember exactly. Was it regarding the maintenance bond? Oh, hold on. Uh, I don't know. I don't have my copy of the last one. Uh, It's probably going to be more of an administrative, just decluttering the language, and it won't have no substantial change, would be my opinion. Okay. So we'll, we'll figure it out. But with, with regard to the language, maybe I missed it when you read it. I thought we said that we were going to want them on photo cells. Uh, yes. Um, instead of a timer. Because the timer, if someone doesn't adjust it, it gets off where a photo cell goes on when it's dark and goes off when the sun comes up. So it just makes it more bulletproof. Okay. So maybe that can be an amendment? Sure. Because I don't think we included that. Okay. So. When would we make such an amendment? Right now? We could include it? So I have two amendments then. <laughs> One is that... Uh, all, all it could street, come back. It could all, be tabled. You know, all street lighting. I, I'd move that. We make an amendment that all street lighting uh, be uh, controlled for on/off with a photo cell, uh, and that uh, we also make an amendment instead of LED bulbs that read LED fixtures because, like, street lights are not bulbs; they're a fixture. You can't like replace the bulb. So uh, minor. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes. Now, do I have to make a motion on the full thing? I move that the proposed amendments to Chapter 22 as further amended tonight be approved. Second. Now, do we do a public hearing? Roll call. Yes. Roll call. Sorry. We, don't. Okay, we, do, sorry. we do that now before we do the... Uh, oh, we'd have to do a public hearing. So before we move on, open the public hearing. <laughs> Nobody in the chambers. Is there any correspondence, Director Mears? None this evening. Close the public hearing. Ahead, Mr. Wooden. Again, I move that the proposed amendments to Chapter 22 is being further amended tonight. Motion made by Mr. Wooden, second by Mr. Horton. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed. Motion passes. Rebel. Any further action on this? We will be sending out the revised subdivision regulations to the planning board. Thank you. Communications and miscellaneous. Motion. Save it. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're going back to the lighting. Instead of calling it bulbs, we call it illumination. Just a word smithing thing. Uh, that helps. I don't know. I have one question uh, about the BP properties. What, what's the latest status on those? They just uh, the gas station up here and the one down High Street. Yeah, they're closed. <laughs> no, as far as what, what uh, any development or sale, or are they just static so far? <laughs> static. Okay. I don't know if Michelle knows. I we have not heard from the BP on High Street uh, here in downtown. And the one uh, on High Street, uh, or in the residential commercial zone, I guess they were cleaning some of the tanks out there, I believe. Okay, so there's nothing... Nothing nothing new to report. Thank you. Any other communications, Ms. Williams, or uh, entertain a motion to adjourn? Motion made by Mr. Robitis, second by Mr. Barry. Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you.